Hey everyone, Mark here. This podcast is sponsored by Engro Games, a brand new publishing company out of Japan. They're kickstarting two micro games right now Reach, a two player cooperative game, and Okazaki, a one to two player trick taker. They come in a limited edition handcrafted package and ship anywhere in the world. Click on the link in the description right now to find out more information before the Kickstarter campaign ends. Now, on to the show. Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast. As always, my name is Mark, and here with me today, all the way over in France, designer of games such as Citadels, Mission Red Planet, Masquerade, all kinds of games, Mystery the Abbey. I've been in the game industry for a very long time, Bruno Fiduti. Thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Hi, Mark. When uh, I initially put out, uh, I, I think it was a tweet asking if people wanted to join me on the podcast, I was ex- super excited to see that you responded, and, and I I set up a form kind of on the on the website, and one of the questions there was, what did they want the topic to be? What do you want the topic to be for the podcast? What What is interesting you at the moment? And you wrote ideas about globalization and board gaming and politics and religion, and I was like, awesome. This is fantastic. I, I, I love to tackle big topics, uh, tricky topics. Things that I haven't talked about before in the podcast, so I'm very excited to see what you have to say on these topics. Do you remember why? I mean, it was a while ago. Uh, we've been setting this up for a while. Do you remember <laughs> what was on your mind when you when you issued those as potential topics for the podcast? Maybe about globalization, because you know this. Last two or three years, I've tried to travel a lot and see how our board games in very different places. And you know, I I'm really impressed. Not really surprised, but impressed by, by the fact that, in fact, it's exactly the same everywhere. <laughs> not that it's no, not that big difference. And but yeah, you know, it's nice to see people coming in. It's interesting that board game culture is something relatively recent, mm-hmm. and since it's something relatively recent, it's I say it's globalized almost from the start, even when it's started from Europe and then the US. When I meet gamers in Japan, I'm often in Japan. Last summer I was in Iran and in Russia and different places. And they all have the same references about games. They I think I'm impressed that the fact that it's gra- it's good that there are more and more games coming from everywhere. And on the other hand, they are not that different from our games. Not that different from what we are used to do, and they. But I like this. I like the fact that it's a relatively recent culture, and so that there is no, we don't have to deal with this, you know, tons and tons and years and centuries of tradition, which, which makes that people have different references, have different universes. Which, of course, it's nice. It's tradition, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's nice, but it's also bothersome and it makes contact difficult and board games you know when i meet people for example when i meet japanese people which i do quite often this last time and we discuss literature we don't have we have a few common references but not that many when we discuss music it's the same we don't have exactly the same references when we discuss board game we have the same references and it makes things much easier i think Mm -hmm. So it's it, it, it's something interesting. And in a way, it's something I like. It makes everything so much easier and faster. Do you think that's because there's something very innate to people that uh, games tap into? Is it just because the... I think it's just because, because there, are, there is no... We don't have, you know, thousand years of tradition of board games. We have 20 years, mm-hmm. and they know everything, and we know everything, and we know the same thing. I, I think it's just this. It's because, you know, of course, it taps more or less in the same kind of people everywhere. You know, I think the other topic I wanted to discuss is religion. I think it's impressive that people who are in board games usually are absolutely not religious. There are very few religious people in board games, and I think that there's a reason to it. 
is that people who are really religious, in fact, they are living in a game the whole time. You know, they have a goal, they have rules, they are living in their own game. They don't need to play games. So it's it's true that it's the same kind of people. But if I were talking about literature of music, it's the same kind of people who are attracted by literature or music in the whole world. Simply, they don't have the same references. They don't have the same book. They don't learn the, the same history at school. So we can understand each other. It's, you know, mm-hmm. personal, I think that cultural difference, the idea of cultural differences is largely bullshit. You know, it's just about slightly different music and not eating the same stuff. But we think we think in the same way. But we don't know the same things. Right. That's what makes it a bit different. And when it comes to board games, not only we think in the same way, but we know the same things. So it's very, so it's so much easier to st- start discussing board games. I was last uh, summer in Iran. I can dis- I could discuss board games with people without any problem. It was much di- more difficult to discuss literature because they don't know French or American novels, which I know, and I don't know uh, Persian novels. So we have a few common references. We all have read Dostoevsky, for example, or something like this. But we don't have that many common references. When it comes to board games, okay, we know the same thing. Like with music, we can discuss rock music. We cannot discuss traditional music because we don't have the same one. And I don't know there and they don't know mine. We can only discuss what is more recent. And with board game, everything is recent. Right, yeah. Uh, If you find a nerd anywhere, they've probably heard of Catan. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Beside the point that it's just easier to talk about, do you think that's advantageous to the development of games? In other words, because the conversation is recent and it's understood globally, uh, do you think that helps people improve pushing the boundaries of games or developing games uh, globally as well? Or do you think that perhaps we'd see more diverse, innovative games if there were separate traditions that we were drawing from rather than kind of one singular tradition. Maybe we could. I don't know. I was saying my girlfriend is Japanese, so I'm not into Japanese literature this last years. And in fact, it's not the same references, but when you start to know a bit, but you see similarities, you saw similar trends, and okay, this I can compare with this, and this I can compare with this in in, in France, etc., etc. So, yeah, it could be a bit more different, but I'm not sure it would be better. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure it would be better. You know, I'm, I hate these people in France who are always talking about we should save the French language. French language is bullshit. It would be so easier if we all spoke, if speak English, and it's so much easier to understand each other. And so, yeah, I think board games are easy for this. It, it's very easy to, we have a common ground from the beginning. And when you meet people, I think the problem when you meet people from different cultures is that, of course, we think in the same way, but we don't, we are not standing on the same ground. We don't have the same roots. We and that's what makes it difficult to understand each other, even when, in fact, we are, we are the same. And with board games, it's so easy. We play the same game. They all have played Catan. They all have played Ticket to Ride everywhere in the world now. And so, so it's the same thing. Yeah, and it seems to me also that board games, maybe even more than... I mean, I mean, you could argue something like stories and music tap into something innately human, but I mean, board games maybe even more so. Like the the fundamental thing of a game is that you have choices, and choices are just fundamental to human existence because we're we're conscious and we can reason, right? We can make choices, and games are about choices, and even the types of choices that you see in games, right? The the question of uh, like a push your luck thing, right? That that exists in everyday life all, anywhere. Or yeah, the question I, I, between I, getting value now or more value later down the road, like the investment question, like things that are in almost every game are, are just we, we, humanly we universal. Games. Yeah, we have this in games, right? In real life, but it's so much, it's simplified in games. Mm-hmm. And in games, you can have 
very good estimate of what the effect, what the consequences are, which in real life, you never know exactly. Oh, yeah. I think because we have lots of choices in real life, maybe far more than in games. But in games, we have simple choices. I do this or I do this. And the way I do it, and if I push a bit, and if I'm tired, and if I'm speaking in a low or high voice, it doesn't matter. In real life, every detail matters. So games are such a very, 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 such a simplification of life. I think maybe the way, the reason we like games is that it makes choices that simple. You know exactly what choices you are making. You know exactly when you are making them. When in real life, oh, I should have done this, I should have done this, but I didn't realize that I was doing this and this and this. In a game, you realize everything. Mm -hmm. You know that your decision is, uh, when I'm playing my diamond, for example, okay, I go forward or not, and everything else doesn't matter. And in that sense, the, 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 the way games simplify or abstract that decision-making and make the consequences very clear... I haven't fully th fleshed out this idea, but I, I've written a little bit about how because games have that aspect, that nature to them, that they can help hone in thinking. They can help us develop better ways of thinking. And I was reading a little bit on your blog, and I know you, you've written about games used in education because you are a, you're also a teacher, and, and you seem moderately against using games as an educational tool, whereas it seems to me that games can be a wonderful educational tool for precisely that reason. Can you comment on that a bit? Yeah. Oh, it's a bit complex. But yeah, I, I don't like games as an educational tool. I think the first reason is that I'm designing games. And so I like, maybe it's a bit, maybe I'm a bit proud, maybe it's uh, maybe it's a lack of modesty, but I like the idea that games are something like art, a bit like literature. You won't say to someone who writes novels that novels are great because you can learn uh, grammar and new words, etc., etc., with reading novels. You read novels because you like to read novels. And I like the idea that we play games because we like to play games. We don't play games to learn something. We don't play games for any other reason than playing games. And I think as an educational tool, there are two main problems with games. The first is that, actually, I like to learn. I think most people like to learn things. And when you say, okay, Oh, it's difficult to learn things. It's complex, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we will play a game to learn this thing in between, this way and this way and this way. In fact, we we got a bit carried away from what we are really trying to learn. We are losing time and energy to learn the rules of the game and trying to win, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, when it's not the heart of the matter. And as a teacher, I see it because when I see teachers trying to use games for teaching, I say most times students are extremely wary of it because I say, okay, you are cheating. You are trying to tell us that we will pray. And in fact, we will learn like every day. <laughs> uh, it's, it's dishonest. And they are extremely wary of this. And that's why it very often it doesn't really work. And I think it's better, it's more honest to just say to them, okay, we will work and we will learn something new. The other problem is what I say at the beginning when I say that games are very, you know, it's simple choices, it's closed world, you know, with straight rules, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And when, what I like as a teacher is when things are open when students can intervene and bring new ideas and what if this and what if that and what if that. And the very structure of a game make, makes that it's not possible. It's not possible in a game to do something which is not specified in the game rules, something which the game is not made for. And it's important when teaching, especially with, you know, I have students who are maybe 15, 16, 17 years old, I think it's important that 
they can bring their other ideas. They can challenge what I say. You cannot challenge the rules of a game. You cannot say, oh, no, these are not good rules. We should play this and this and this and this. No, we are playing the game. It's, it's a problem. You know, I'm teaching economics. It's a problem with econ some economic theory now, which is trying to make everything fit, you know, in kind of like a kind of mathematical model and saying it works like, like this. Okay, and once you are in the model, once you accept the model, there's nothing to do except to act as is specified by the model. You have to say, okay, reality is not like this. And I think reality is not like a game. And so I don't say that it, it's never useful. It can be useful, some, you know, learning some very, very specific skills in maths or something like this. There can be a few right fun games which can help. But, you know, all this, you know, gamification and, you know, large game trying to, you know, I, I think it makes things far too square, closed, uh, when if there is a time where we can be open and discussing when people are young and when they are learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've discovered, I, I've had a similar tension because I teach debate part time. In, in part of the joy of, of debate is that it is a game, but the rules are as, as simple as possible. It's just like, you know, you have a certain amount of time to speak, but what you actually debate about and the structure of what is acceptable to say and what is not acceptable to say is all up to debate. It's up to uh, the students to hash that out and the judge to make a determination about who had the best reasoning and such. But, you know, over time there have been kind of not rules, but things that have become universally accepted as, okay, you just can't do this in a debate round. It's just a bad idea. And I've had, I've had the, this year in particular, because I was teaching my, the main uh, group I teach with, it's almost entirely new debaters. So I kind of started at the beginning with, with debate theory. And I've been struggling with this tension of, wanting to get through all the topics and just say, okay, don't do this, do this. This is something you can think about, but also encouraging them to question what I'm saying, right? When I say don't do something, I can explain a long and lengthy reason why it ends up being a bad idea, but I also want them to push against that. I want them to think, well, wait a minute. Well, what if I did try to do this thing? Uh, and think through the implications because, you know, a lot of the joy I had in debate was trying very bad ideas and then discovering why they're bad ideas, discovering the reasoning behind all of it. Yeah, and getting students to both believe you and question you so you can have that rich, fertile Ooh. discussion is, is difficult, and I've, I've discovered this year in particular. Back to gaming i i mean i can i can completely see the argument for how games are just not efficient in the in the classroom but again i wonder if even outside the idea of games as an educational tool specifically it still seems to me that because games can abstract and simplify these kind of core basic decision making processes that games can still be a tool even accidentally even if people aren't trying to use them as an educational tool, they can still end up helping us understand better the way we think and understand how to make better decision making. Would you agree with that? Yeah, certainly. Mm -hmm. Certainly, I agree with this. I only want to say that, you know, among gamers, we are always saying that, you know, people accidentally learn things while playing games, which is true. It's not really specific of games. It's true of reading books. It's true of walking in the streets. It's true of most of the things you do in life. You learn things when doing them. It's what is maybe, and it's what you are saying, I'm thinking of it, it's maybe specific, specific of games that it helps, you know, realize the effects of decision. Yeah, that's true, maybe. But, you know, this, this kind of incidental learning, it's true of games. But I'd say, like, it's true of many, many things in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't. I really don't think that games have a specific link to learning. Because, you know, children play a lot. There must be a reason, and they are learning. So maybe they know some things. They understand some things that I don't understand. But uh, I have a problem with this idea that we learn through gaming. 
mm-hmm. that we were about, or more than other ways. Yeah, and, and you look at efforts to gamify a lot of things, and it seems when people talk about gamification, they're not talking about... They may mention, like, okay, we're, we're helping people learn better, but it seems to me a lot of those things, it's just helping incentivize people to do the thing they want them to do, right? If you if you gamify an activity, yeah. you're providing, you know, this kind of psychological reward structure. That doesn't mean they're learning better. It just means that more people may opt in. Certainly. You know, we were talking about religion. Religion was one of the first try at gamification of life telling people that if you do this, it's good and you will have rewards. If you do this, it's bad and you won't have it. It's Hmm. gamification. Interesting. Yeah, that's an angle I haven't thought of before. Thanks again to our sponsor for this podcast, Engrow Games, who are offering two fascinating micro games on Kickstarter right now. Reach simulates three-dimensional movement and momentum in space as players work together to perform a zero-gravity rescue mission. Okazaki looks inward at the building blocks of life itself as players attempt to replicate a strand of DNA using asymmetric abilities. And get this, both games are a mere 18 cards each. Click on the link in the description below to find out more. Let's 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 dig into that then. Let's let's talk about religion because you mentioned earlier that you see that there's a larger proportion at least in your experience of gamers who are non-religious. Do you think it's because of this religion as game that that's yeah, I, true? I think, it's this. I, I think it's this. I think that, uh, you know, I, I, I was surprised. It's, it's, uh, I think it was last year. Uh, on the board game geeks, there, there is every year kind of a big, I don't remember who did this, but, you know, kind of big stats where people answer who are you and, you know, stats male, female, age, etc. And there was a question about religion. And I was surprised that there was something like 60% of the people on the board game geek who answered this, who said that they were not religious, which is very few for Europe, but I think probably more than average in the US. I think in the US you have maybe one person in three who is not religious. I think it's even fewer than that, actually. I haven't seen recent statistics, but okay. the so last time I, I looked, it was around 15%, I think. Oh, whoa. So I was surprised to see that more than half of the people who answer this on Board Game Geek say that they were either they didn't believe in God or agnostics. So I said it's a lot. Of course, there are not only Americans on Board Game Geek, but I think there are the majority. And I say it confirms this idea that, you know, I think people who are really religious are not really attracted to games. They are not really attracted to games because because they don't need it. Because games are really a way of taking a rest from complex reality and for a while having simple rules, simple decisions, knowing what we are doing, where we are going, etc., etc. And if you really, I don't say if you believe in a creator or God, it's, it's something else, but if you are really into a religion with its rules on which say, you have to do this and this and this. Uh, you can eat this and you cannot eat this. And if you do this, you will go to hell. And if you do this, uh, you will be rewarded, etc., etc. Maybe people life after death and all that stuff. If you are really in, in something like this, it means that you live your daily life with rules which are exactly like rules of a game, which are, you know, very simple, which have no rational uh, basis. It's just that, okay, these are the rules. And I think people who play games, who need, really need to play games, are people who don't have this in their daily life, who don't have strict rules in their daily life. And they need a rest and they need strict rules from time to time. And I would even say that there are a few religious people who play games. I know a few ones. But I think they are... I think maybe they are not that sure of themselves. Maybe, you know, they say, okay, maybe they are the ones who understand that it's not simple. Maybe they have some doubts. And so they have to go into a game because in a game you don't have to, you cannot doubt everything. You cannot doubt the rules in a game. So so Uh, you think that part of the appeal of gaming is the certainty of it? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure that the appeal of gaming is 
Well, there are other ways, but other ways, but one of the main appeal of gaming is that it's certain and simple. That it's a closed world. You start to play, you are in the game with rules. And when it's finished, it's finished. That's why I can I can kill people in a game. I can play a war game when I'm absolutely totally non-violent. Uh, and I can kill everyone. I can go on a, on a rampage in a game. It's not a problem, even when I play uh, even you know role playing game because it's a game. It's it's made for this. Mm-hmm. It's a game, and then it's over. And when I'm in the game, there are rules which are not the same as the rules in real life. So, so what do you think of games that deliberately try to push against that? Or even like role-playing games, right? Which can be a lot more emotionally fraught, um, can delve into more personal topics, or at least kind of inherently mass... Or, or yeah, I, have I, the I, risk I, of blending, right? I think they call it bleed in role-playing, right? Blending the person's actual emotions with the emotions of their character. You know, I, I don't play tabletop role-playing game, but I still play LARPs from time to time. And I see it as something like theater. Anyone, any comedian can play any role in a theater or in, in a movie. He doesn't think that he's the guy in the scene, that he's the character. He knows that he's playing the character. And I think it's the same. I think we don't really, I think when you, even when I play, you know, three or four days LARP, which I do maybe once a year now, I still know that I'm playing. And I I don't identify with the character I'm playing. I don't take things too seriously. And that's why I'm, you know, I'm wary, you know, of this Nordic raps and I don't like this because I think really they are, I think they are wrong in, in thinking that it's part of real life and that we, sh- we should treat it this way and we should be very careful with everything because it's not real life. I can play a very bad guy in a rap. I have no problem with that. Even I though, think. I mean, there, there is obviously clearly a, a distinction between the game in real life. There's uh, the magic circle <laughs> or the bubble or whatever you want to call it. But, I mean, if you're playing a LARP or a role-playing game and in the heat of the moment, in an, in a, in an intense time, you feel an emotion, that's still a real emotion, though, right? How, yes, I, it's a real emotion, like you feel an emotion when you, are, when you are at the movie. You know, when you are at the movie, I can, you know, I can cry when seeing a movie. Mm-hmm. And I even can go to a movie to cry. When I don't try to cry in real life, I know it's not the same. Mm-hmm. Problem with making people cry in a rap because I think it's for them exactly when, like when they cry in a movie. By the way, I looked up statistics about religion in America. It looks like there's different ways they ask the question, right? So the people who are unaffiliated, who don't claim a religious a religious affiliation, is 26 percent. But there's a sizable number of people who say they're not religious, but they are spiritual. The not religious, not spiritual number is 18%, which is probably what I was remembering from before. So I think there is a rise of kind of general, more vague spirituality uh, claims in the U.S. Anyways, that's the actual numbers on that. But yeah, I mean, I've always like, I've always recognized that there are probably more people who are non-religious in the board gaming world, I always assumed that was simply because it's part of nerd culture. Nerd culture tends to have more people in the hard sciences and people in the hard scientists tend to be more non-religious. But I've never thought about it in the sense of the certainty of games. I'm not sure that nerd culture is that much scientist people. You know, I'm a literary people. I I studied history. Mm -hmm. Most of the people... I know in gaming and design, game designers, etc., etc. Most of them studied literature or social sciences. So there are a few people from science, but I don't think the gaming world has that many people from, with a scientific background. Because hmm. my experience has been completely different. Yeah. I mean, I feel yeah. like we just don't know the same people. Sure, yeah, of course. Who knows the most representative people? Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if that but, board game geek poll had had a question along those lines. That'd be interesting to find some actual data on. 
let's let's talk about your designs actually because if if you don't mind we, we didn't discuss this before but i mean in reading your blog i don't remember the exact article but but along the lines when you're talking about games as educational tools you i believe you mentioned that you're not a particular fan of heavier games games that are trying to say something that have some kind of political agenda behind them or trying to simulate something political or, or sociological. And that seems to be reflected in the games that you design, which tend to be simpler, perhaps a bit more abstract. Are there any games along those lines, games that are trying to tackle a thorny subject or games that are trying to educate uh, the player that, that you do enjoy? Or is that just something that that's just not to your taste? Uh, I think it's not my taste. But maybe simply because I tend to prefer lighter games. And then when, when you have a light and simple games game, you have to have light and simple theme. You cannot try to tell complex things. It's like a difference between a, a song and a big 300 uh, pages novel. Uh, if you like to, you know, just a three-minute song, you cannot discuss philosophy and deep things in it. Because it's, you know, it's very simple. So you write a rough song or something, you know, it's always the same. And people like it because it's short and it's that way. If you want something very complex, you will go to big, heavy novels. So I think maybe it's possible to have deeper message, deeper stuff with with very big games. Even when I'm not, I don't like the idea once more that games are useful and try to teach something, etc., etc. But after all, some novels try. But with the kind of games I design, you know, games which are played in 5, 10, 20 minutes. Okay, it's just, you know, one, two, three mechanism, a few puns with that will be used as a theme, and that's it. You cannot go into very complex things uh, with this. So, but I admit that there is some of a paradox which, say, if you see game among board game designers, I'm probably one of the board game designers who is most often discussing politics and one of the board game designer who has the fewest politics in his games. <laughs> so it's but I think I think the main reason it's because you know I think right games are not political. Just because only the the, sy the systems are too simple. Yeah, I think only big games can be. Mhm. Mm yeah, and I was talking to Tom Russell a few weeks ago, uh, who a lot of, I mean, I, most of his games at least are historical, right, or, or trying to tackle political subjects, and he was talking about how, to him, the games are about trying to emulate various systems, and they're trying to, and, you know, on an abstract level, they're trying to capture those systems, especially when you're talking about a historical game. Do you see games having value in trying to, you know, with some level of complexity or, or, or some level of abstraction, rather, capture the systems by which, within which people made various decisions, either through history or even speculative, you know, the way that people may make decisions in, in if they're put in various systems in real life or in the future? Uh, or, or do you think it's just too simplified, too abstract necessarily in a game to be able I to do think that. It's, I think in, in general it's it's too abstract. It would have to be a very, very long and complex game mm -hmm. to have something really to do something really efficient. And so it's you know, if I want to learn something about history, about politics, I'd rather read a book uh, than play a game. And also because if I want to learn something, I'd say it's by myself. I want the time to think on it, etc., etc. When I play a game, it's with friends. We have fun. There's whiskey, there's beer, and we talk and and we eat, etc., etc. It's it's not the same thing. I don't think so. I think I think games are for me at least games are not made for this. Are there any examples in your games where something did? slip in there maybe even something as simple as, as a little reference or a nod to some an idea yeah. or a political not, yes. thing not yes I, I i like to make uh nods in games they can be about literature about music or about politics but it's you know it's just nods puns jokes it's not something very very serious mm -hmm. uh, uh if i think about my games or astera which has 
something you know based on the prisoner's dilemma and seeing how how we are now not dealing with issues like climate change etc cetera, etc cetera. so there were points to this but but I say you know not that many mm-hmm. I have a prototype I'm working in now which is about Santa Claus and his little elves and the little elves don't like that you know it's bad work bad pay it's called in the factory or they are not paid for overtime. There are no holiday for Christmas. And the boss is brutal with his animals, etc., etc. And there are harassment issues and everything in the factory. And so they are stealing toys on the line to sell, sell them on eBay. So, okay, it's kind of a joke. But, you know, I, I, wouldn't, I won't say that it's a political game. It's just that the setting makes fun. But that's it. It's not trying to teach something it's just that i find some you know like when a cartoonist makes a political cartoon uh, okay he makes a political cartoon who goes with his ideas but a political cartoon is never really teaching something it's just to uh, remember people what they already think or already know but going back to the paradox you mentioned right you 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 don't think po- politics or or, or these more complex ideas can can work in games, yet you talk about the subjects quite a bit. Do you think games then can be a good jumping off point for a discussion, for a good discussion about a, a weighty topic, an ethical topic, or a political topic? Can well, that many, be their value? You know, in real life, I'd say that games often are a way not to start a discussion. Uh, when you are, with, you are with friends and everyone is too tired, or there are people you don't really want to have a political discussion with, and after all, you like them, nevertheless, and you want to spend some good time with them, so let's play a game. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> sometimes it's even the opposite. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah. You know, it's true that very often when I'm with, when I have friends here, we'll go for gaming, gaming nights. Okay, we, we start with drinking, eating, then we pray, and very often at two or three in the morning, you know, we start discussing and, you know, remaking the world. Well, okay, like everyone, but we would probably have done it even if we had another hobby. I'm sure. not specifically linked with games. Mm-hmm. Going again into into your designs, just briefly, I'm, I'm curious because you enjoy lighter games, you tend to design lighter games, do you typically approach the design from those two, three mechanical ideas first, or do you go theme first? Do you, do you have an idea for a thematic element and fit in the mechanisms from there? It depends. There's absolutely no rule. You know, I, mm-hmm. I say very often, you know, I just, I have an idea for a game, and very often it starts with kind of a mix, kind of both, you know, idea and mechanism, but it can still change. One of them can change later. You know, it can go back and forth. But there's really no rule. Maybe 20 or 30 years ago, I was more starting with theme, with setting. And now I'm more starting with mechanisms. But maybe it's also because I'm making simpler and lighter stuff. I don't know. But I, I'm not even sure. You know, it depends. Mm-hmm. But you think you are, even now you're making lighter games than you than you did in the past? You're, yeah. you're trending t- towards that way. Yeah, I think you're you're one of the more prolific designers in the board game world. Are there are there any ideas, any mechanisms, any thematic setting ideas that you've wanted to design and haven't found a way to tackle yet, that yet? Yeah, I say deck building. I like the idea of deck building, but a deck building game can only be something. Well, maybe there are a few exceptions, but most deck building games are, you know, complex things which need a lot and a lot and a lot of fine tuning and play testing, etc., etc., etc. And you know, I'm becoming becoming old and I'm becoming lazy, and I don't have the time for it. So, a few type of game which I'm theoretically interested in, but I'm far too lazy to start. And I'd say deck building and legacy games. Oh yeah, yeah, it's interesting, but yeah. It's for people who are 20 or 30 years <laughs> old. <laughs> uh, do you think, do you think deck building, you know, in Dominion comes out, do you think 
that's kind of a a major moment in in the short history of, of gaming i don't know it's it's something i like what mm-hmm. is a major moment i don't know it depends on people no i i don't think it's such a major moment but it's just a mechanism i like mm-hmm. all right uh I think that's all the questions I had. Again, thank you so much, Bruno, for coming on the podcast. This was fascinating. I love talking about these new interesting subjects. I love hearing your perspective on it. If people want to find and keep in touch with you, I know you have the blog that I referenced, uh, just for uh, uh, If people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way? Uh, you know, I have my blog. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. And I'm too old for Instagram and all that stuff. Oh, man, so I, I, stopped I just started tweet. Instagram, and it's like a, <laughs> learning a new language. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I tried to learn it a bit last summer when I was in Iran because, you know, Facebook and Twitter are more or less blocked there. So I tried to use Instagram, but whoa, I don't know it. <laughs> Yeah, there are certain buttons and certain aspects of the site I haven't yeah. even bothered to touch yet. And, and it's like, all I'll about just... image, and I'm more, I'm more, I think I'm more with text. I'm not an image guy. Yeah, yeah, same here, I don't same do here. movies, and I don't like comics, so it's something which is only, mostly about pictures, it's not for me. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, that's how you can get in touch with Bruno. Thanks for listening, everybody. To find what I do, go to thethoughtfulgamer.com. Don't forget to rate and review the podcast on iTunes or wherever you get podcasts. If you'd like to support us, go to patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and, like I said, Instagram. Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.